Hello, this is Anil Kumar from Back to the Bible Radio Broadcast. Welcome back as we continue our current series, The Mysteries of the Cross, with Dr. John Newfeld. Today, we will discuss the topic of why Jesus died. Now, turn with me to Galatians chapter six, verse fourteen, as we go back to the Bible with Dr. John. We've been asking the question of what Jesus did after he died on the cross. I find no biblical evidence that Jesus ever descended into hell. Where did Jesus go after he died? The answer, I think, is rather straightforward. His body was consigned to a tomb, and his spirit ascended into heaven. But why then does he appear to Mary and tell her not to cling to him because he has not yet ascended to his Father? Well, the answer should be obvious. After three days, Jesus' spirit returned to his body, and he was bodily raised. It was his raised body that had not yet ascended into heaven. And so what Jesus experienced after death is a first fruit of what follows. We who believe in Christ, like Christ, upon dying, will immediately go to heaven. And just like Christ, we await the resurrection of our body. No believer in Christ goes to hell. And so what we can say about the cross is it did for Jesus in one sense exactly what it does for us. It opened the door to instant paradise, to an instant shout of triumph as we enter into the gates of glory. Now, I've said that there are two outstanding and controversial questions that I wanted to deal with when discussing the cross. The second question, perhaps far more controversial than the first, is the question of who Jesus died for. Now, there may be some that might be surprised by the question. We thought we already knew the entire answer. So in the brief time I have, let me highlight the difference and provide in my perspective what might be a way forward to this important question. In John 1 verse 29, when John the Baptist sees Jesus, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Or many of us are quite aware of 1 John 2, verse 2. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That, at least at the outset, seems to be an open and shut case. Jesus died for everyone. And some who are hearing this for the first time might be surprised that there is some controversy regarding this issue. After all, when we share the gospel with our non-Christian friends, we might have used the line, Christ suffered and died for you. See, that seems obvious. But there are those who argue just as strongly that Christ died only for the elect. Let's listen to some of the Bible texts that speak about Christ dying specifically for his own. John 10 verse 10 has Jesus saying, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. In that passage, it's quite clear that those in Jesus' sheepfold is not a description of the whole world. Rather, it is a description of the elect. For we listen to Jesus in John 10 27 say, my sheep hear my voice and they will never listen to the voice of a stranger. And so it turns out in the passage in question, the sheep that Jesus has died for are those who hear him and who will never stray from his fold. Other passages seem to say the same thing. In Acts 20, verse 28, Paul speaks of the church of God, which is obtained with the blood of his son. In other words, the nature and uniqueness of the church is that it, unlike everyone else, has been purchased with the blood of Christ. We could look at many other passages like that. In fact, the New Testament is full of them. But notice one more. In Romans 14, Paul presents an extended argument for Christian freedom and not putting a stumbling block in the way of a Christian brother. And then in verse 15, he says, For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. Now, clearly in that text, the one for whom Christ died is the very same one as the one who is saved. So the saved are the ones for whom Christ died. For a great many people, the entire dispute comes down to two essential factors. First, if Christ died for our sins, then they must be paid for. As an example, let's consider a man, let's call him Harry, who has a large debt, let's say, on his house. 
If his friend Frank goes to the bank and pays Harry's debt, then the debt is paid for, no matter how Harry responds. And so say what those on one side of the debate, We can't say that Christ died for someone's sins and then argue that they're not paid for. Either they are or they're not, and if they are, nothing can be added to it. And the second factor often surrounds the question of the efficacy of Christ's death. Is Christ's death on the cross 100% effective or not? But on the other side, there will be those who will argue from 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, which clearly says that Christ died for the sins of the whole world, and shouldn't that settle the debate? Well, who's right? Well, for my part, I can't possibly think that I can settle a debate that is hundreds of years old in one small broadcast, but I might point out something that people on both sides of the debate will acknowledge as obvious. All of us know that if I were to say to a Christian, Christ died for you, and if I were to say the same words to a non-Christian, Christ died for you, I would really be saying two very different things. Let me explain. When I tell a Christian Christ died for you, I want to reassure him or her that their sins really are removed. If they feel anxiety that they might not be accepted by God after all, or wonder, am I really going to heaven? And then can I really have assurance of my salvation? I would respond by saying, wait a minute, sister, stop with the self-condemnation. Christ died for you. And if Christ died for you, then there are no sins you have committed that will keep you from God's loving embrace. You are accepted in the beloved. You are welcome in the holy of holies. You can call God Abba, Father. Don't let the devil whisper condemnation for your sins have been been atoned for. Christ died for you. Now, when I tell a non-Christian Christ died for you, I don't mean any of that. I mean Christ died so that a free offer could be made to you. Were it not for the death of Jesus on a cruel cross, no offer could be made to you at all. But as it is, Christ has satisfied the righteous demands of the Father. And if you will but respond and repent of your sins and receive his free gift of grace, you can have the forgiveness of your sins. So do you see what I've done? I have described that which we all intuitively know. Whatever we mean by the words, Christ died for you, we all know that those words, when applied to either the saved or to the unsaved, actually mean two very different things. So here's what we know for certain from the cross. Not all will be saved. The death of Jesus makes a free offer to all. A doorway has been opened. An invitation has been given. Whosoever will may come. It's in that sense and in that sense only that Christ died for the sins of the whole world. But for us who are saved, the words Christ died for us means that our sins are paid for. The great cost of sin has been paid in the currency of the blood of our precious Savior. God's justice has been satisfied in the cross, and I bear my sins no more. And so it is more than correct to call the church of the living Savior the body of those for whom Christ has died. For his death is applied to us, not in terms of an invitation, but in terms of a debt that has been truly paid. Every single Christian knows that, that Christ has died for us. It is the most precious thing that we could ever say, the most glorious truth upon which our minds can meditate. God is not angry with me. His anger is satisfied in the cross. The devil can't have me in any sense. Christ defeated him on the cross. Indeed, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. The cross has seen to that. And so let me end with a passage of scripture I've already alluded to comes from Galatians 6, verse 14. Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. You know, in this passage, Paul is saying that when he looks at his own life, he sees nothing as praiseworthy that would commend him before God. Indeed, he goes beyond even that thought. 
Everything that can be offered up in this world, which might include fame and the adulation of others, is for him but rubbish. After all, Paul was a rising star in Judaism and thought that to give all that up for the sake of the cross was nothing at all. See, we do the same. If it's money or fame or acceptance from friends and family to be spoken of well in this world or whatever pleasure or comfort the world has to offer, far be it from me to boast or to relish in the thought of that. The only thing I relish in, the only thing that captivates my imagination and inspires and propels me forward is but one thing, the cross on which my Savior has died. Indeed, the whole world with its riches have been crucified to me and I to it. To him be the glory. Our Heavenly Father, I want to pray very specifically for those who are hearing me at this moment who have not yet committed their hearts to Christ as Savior and Lord. May they hear this word. Were it not for the death of Jesus, no such offer would ever have been made to me. I would have been dead to the things of God forever. Heavenly Father, I pray for anyone hearing me that they might respond and say, God, in loving kindness, sent his only son so that I might come to him. And so, Lord, even now, take my life. I confess my sins. I surrender my life into your loving hands. I would be your child. I would trust in your cross till the day that I die and be with you. Amen. At Back to the Bible, it is our passion and desire above all to see lives transformed as a result of teaching the Word of God every day and we are committed to making many of our resources available for free. For example, anyone can listen to the broadcast online and you can subscribe to our Confident Living magazine. With the support of so many dedicated supporters and listeners, the ministry has been blessed to continue further God's kingdom in our nation. Together with God's blessings, We can make a difference in spreading the gospel message that Jesus saves. To find out how you can get involved, please call us at 9492-440070. Call us at 9492-440070 or email us at info at backtothebible.in. 